We want to kind of give you a picture of, of some of the key things that, that over the summer we're going to be exploring. Okay, this isn't like, there might be some people who are really concerned. I, people look at things differently, don't they? Like when we say, speak to the person next to you, there's a host of introverts here who are just like, this is my worst life. Um, <laughs> And, and so, like, uh, like, I'm not with you there, I don't share that particular one, but I do have a string of friends who, who just wouldn't want to be thrust into a conversational situation. So I'm sorry about that, you know. Um, I'm sorry that people exist, um, but no, I'm joking. Um, but, you know, we're gonna have to cross some boundaries and it might be a little bit uncomfortable and stuff in the initial bit, but I have a feeling, actually, that that will change as time goes along. Not that you become a different person, but, but that actually the way we interact and what we expect from each other maybe grows a bit. So we've got a few key messages over the summer that we want to explore. And what this isn't, okay, this isn't taking everything that we've ever had and lobbing it out the window, all right? That's not what it is. Okay, so when I spoke about the ministry team, I'm not devaluing what we're doing. In fact, in, in that environment, what I'm saying is that's super important because it's, for me, one of the clearest articulation of being kingdom carriers that I see in what we do on, on a Sunday morning. Like you're sharing Jesus with people and there's nothing you can possibly do to meet that need except give Jesus, right? So that's why I love it. But what I'm saying is let's blow it open, okay? So the key messages that we've got, the first is this. The church is not a place, it's not a building, it's not an organisation, it is the people, okay? We're not trying to reimagine that, that is fact, okay? The church is you. I've always said this, you can't become a Christian and not be part of the church. It's an oxymoron. Like, what, when you become a Christian, when you decide to follow Jesus, you are the church, all right? It's just how you work that out. And we're saying, you, the people, are the church, not the place that we meet in. Yeah. I think our second messaging that we're gonna try and get across is that the church is an alternative and a distinctive community, but we're gonna ask how and what that looks like and why. The Bible speaks about God's people being a holy people and it uses analogies like it's a priesthood. And there's something in that which in 2022, you might look at and be like, what on earth does it mean to be a priest when I walk into an office on a Tuesday morning? Or what does it mean to be a priest in my family? And so at some sense, we've got to realize, okay, as a church, we're not just meeting because we're a fun social group on a Sunday. And if you're here, it's cool that you came for a fun social group, but over the summer, you're probably going to realize we're more than a fun social group. Mm. Nor are we just a social justice organization, although we love to help the poor. There's something really distinctive about Jesus's church that he talks about regularly, but getting into the depths of that again and asking what it looks like for us in Jersey in 2022, that's something that we're going to need to come back to a few times and look at some scriptures on. So the third thing is this thing that we talk about all the time. And uh, I say it, and it makes no sense to a lot of people. If you just come in and you're at church for your first time today, I'm going to use some jargon for you, okay? As the church, I believe we are to be kingdom carriers. Kingdom carriers. Some people who have been churchy for a long time, you'll get that. Other people will be like, what are you talking about, you weirdo? But I'm saying, like, one of the things we want to talk about is how we carry the kingdom of God everywhere we go. How we carry the kingdom of God, the presence of Jesus, everywhere we go. And I think finally, we're just going to look at the scales of what it means to be as a church. Obviously, this is one expression of the church on a Sunday. We have gathered to worship together and to enjoy fellowship and to community and to lift up the name of Jesus. But again, when you walk out into your various spheres during this week, it's not that church has stopped. It's that there's a different... Um, expression of what church is during the week. And in some senses, we're gonna talk a little bit about the micro and the macro of church. There are these like micro expressions where we sort of get together on a Sunday. And I know you might think this is the wrong way around, but the micro is this. We are the kingdom of God, we've gathered on a Sunday. The macro is 200 people across Jersey every week carrying God's kingdom into various spheres and families and friendship groups and social groups. So we wanna talk about what church means on those different levels. And hopefully, as Tim has mentioned a little bit, blow the box open a little bit on what church actually is and could be. Because it would be amazing as we continue this discussion as a community over the next few months, for all of you, every single person here to feel empowered and equipped and excited to walk into spheres where there are people that don't know Jesus. 
to understand what it actually means, not just an ethereal concept to bring light into a dark place. We talk about, there's a lot of Christian jargon that goes around when we talk about the church. And part of, I think, what we want to do over the summer is actually explore what that actually means. We want this to be a practical three months. And so we're really excited for where that goes. I'm going to continue. Um, there's, <laughs> Tim gave me a nod of permission. Um, and so based on that, we're not going to go on for too much longer, but there's two sort of foundational scriptures um, that we have come across. And I want to share one today, and Tim will then share the other one. Um, that actually started this whole conversation. And so I haven't just been checking my phone, by the way, if you've seen me looking at my phone, I've got notes on here. Um, but Matthew 16, verses 13 to 20, I just want to read that out to you. You've probably or may have heard this scripture before, a key scripture on the church. And it's, um, it says, now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, Others say Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus said to him, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter replied and he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then Jesus strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. And there's so much that you can pick from that passage. I feel like there's actually a lot of encouragement in there for us as the church in today's day and age. These sort of encouraging like Jesus being like the gates of hell are not gonna prevail against you. I had the opportunity to actually go to Caesarea Philippi about five years ago where this exchange took place. And there are these huge temples cut into the cave. There's this, it's a, a mountainous region in the north of Israel. There's temples cut into the cage, in, in te sorry, temples cut, cut into the cliffs. And these temples were used to worship these various sort of Roman and Greek and various other deities. And there's this one cave that goes really, really deep that was called the gates of hell. And so when Jesus says this, he is not only referring to what he is standing in front of, which he's saying, look, you know about all these sort of demonic, these other deities. I promise you no one of these are gonna prevail against the church that I'm establishing. And he's speaking of spiritual realities and saying, you know what? This light that I'm bringing into the world is gonna be unextinguishable. And my followers, when they carry this light, they're going to have that same power wherever they go and wherever they walk. So there's a lot of encouragement for the church in there. But the one thing I want to pick up on this morning, which has really sort of blown my thinking on this journey as I've been sort of thinking and preparing about this, is the word that Jesus chooses to use to describe his church, which we now translate as church in our modern day and age. And it's a Greek word, ecclesia. Ecclesia. You may have heard that word before. This is the word that Jesus uses to articulate, which Matthew then records that Jesus says, I will build my ecclesia. And this is interesting when you look at it because Jesus had two real obvious religious examples that he could have used when he's trying to describe to his disciples what he's gonna build. He could have said, I'm gonna, on this rock, Peter, I'm gonna build my new temple. That would have made sense to them because they're like, oh, I get what the old temple was and therefore this new temple, we're sort of creating a, a new version of the temple. Or he could have said to his followers, which were of course brought up Jewish, on this rock, Peter, I'm gonna build my new synagogue. And they also would have understood that of like, oh yeah, I get what the synagogue is. But Jesus didn't. And that's really interesting. He uses this word ecclesia. And ecclesia was not a religious word at the time. It was a secular word used by both the Greek and then the Roman empires to describe a system of government. It was an assembly of people meeting for a governmental purpose. That's what an ecclesia was. So when Jesus uses this word ecclesia, He's actually saying something quite dramatic. He's essentially saying, what I'm establishing here is a kingdom, a different kind of government. You may be used to your religious practices in the temple or the synagogue, but that's not what I'm doing. I'm building a kingdom. And on this rock, the church is gonna be a kingdom. And interestingly, the word ecclesia, for hundreds of years when the Bible was first translated in the first versions of the Bible was translated as assembly rather than church. Church was a later addition. And assembly, I think, also captures this idea of wherever Christians are gathering, 
there is a kingdom established. And it's interesting when you then look into the word ecclesia and how it was used, the Romans in particular had this idea as they expanded their kingdom or their empire. If I was a Roman soldier and I was sent to fight somewhere in Gaul or God forbid England, that far away, I am not in- planning permission for that. Uh, yeah, they probably did need planning permission. Um, <laughs> If I'm out in Gaul or England, I'm a Roman soldier, I'm far from my home in Rome. But if I was to meet with another Roman soldier or a third Roman soldier out in Gaul or out in Britain, and we were to meet and have a drink together, guess what the Romans called that? An ecclesia. Because in that moment, despite the fact they were in Gaul, the kingdom of Rome was established where they stood. Where two or three are gathered, Jesus says, there I am. And when I started looking and thinking about this, I'm like, I think some of the sort of religious ideas where church has ended up, all of that, it's all served a purpose, but I'm not sure it was quite what Jesus had in his heart when he said, I'm building an ecclesia. Because where two or three gather in St. Helier in an office, the kingdom of heaven is there. When you walk into a family or a social situation, the kingdom of heaven is with you. And so part of what we're going to blow open over this next three months is what does it mean for us to move from being a group of people that gather on a Sunday and sing a few songs to being people that understand that wherever we meet, there is a governmental capacity to what's going on. There is an authority that we carry in the name of Jesus. And it's not a common like overbearing authority where we try and push down other people. It's Jesus's servanthood authority, right, that we carry. And it's realizing that we are wherever we go, we have a light that can shatter the darkness. And that's where we're landing with Ecclesia. And so that's the first of the foundational scriptures that we want to build these next three months on. And I'm going to let Tim share the second. It's interesting stuff, isn't it? <clears throat> you know, I think, um, I, I think sometimes when we challenge an idea, uh, you think that we think that we've always been on the right side of the idea. And, uh, and I would just say at this moment, I don't think I've been on the right side of this idea. Not all the time. Like I, I wanna reimagine and I want at my heart level to be challenged. And I want you to be challenged and for us to be changed into what God sees his church being. So I don't want you to think that we think we've got it all together. What we're saying is we want to open the discussion. And we know that God has brought us together for such a time as this. Like, and we know that God has established us. And there's some things that are just incredible that God has given us as tools as a church. But we want to move into everything that he's calling us to together. Okay. And I want to encourage you as well on this. So the second scripture that's really key for our time in the field is this, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, a people of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Like I said before, you can't decide to follow Jesus, but opt out of being his people, being the church. You, you can't. You have become part of the church when you follow Jesus and you make him king. Not only that though, this you've become a chosen race. You've become a people of God. You, you are a people marked by your king. You are, you are now his. The Bible says all sorts of things about this. It says, you know, we've jettisoned fear. We've no longer got a spirit of, of bondage to fear, but we've been given a spirit of sonship, adoption, identity. It says you've You've been born, again, of imperishable seed. What's imperishable seed? Imperishable is eternal. Eternal seed that you have been made in the likeness of God. You've been born as God's children, imperishable. It says that you 
have been perfected forever. He's perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So we've got this being sanctified thing, but also you've been born into a nation of perfection. That's the, the nation of God. Effectively, the kingdom of God is perfection. You've been born into it, but you're still changing, being sanctified. The Bible says all kinds of things about our, our na the nature of our kingdom belonging to the kingdom. But I want, you to, I want you to grasp this this morning. If you've invited Jesus to be king in your life, you've become a priest. To me, it's maybe ambassador is a better word and it's still a biblical word. But you are an ambassador like, okay, you've been born into this kingdom. Your nation is the kingdom of heaven. Now, suddenly when people see you, you might be the only person or the only representation that they see of what the kingdom of heaven looks like. That's why when you're in your workplace, you are the church. You are the, you're the ecclesia in your marketplace. It's a challenge, isn't it? Because when you drop in on someone, uh, when you're surfing and you tell them to jog on, or when you're driving like a lunatic and uh, you're like, you know, um, accidentally make some hand gestures that don't mean good to see you, mate. Um, you know, or whatever it is where you make mistakes, you realise I've not been an ambassador of the kingdom. And that's right. We should, be, we should have that tension, right? Because we've become priests. What is, what is a priest? You're serving people with the kingdom of God daily. You've become a connection point. Like... The priest was the person who stood on behalf of the people before God. And so your priestly role now is that you stand in this, in the world as a connection point for people to say, this is what God's kingdom's like. It's a massive idea, a massive idea. And the thing is, once upon a time, you were not in this realm. You weren't a people. Once upon a time, you hadn't received that mercy from God. But now you have. Can I just say, this block is getting super hot on my bare feet. <laughs> Woo! Come on. Um, oh, that was a challenge. You know, once upon a time, you were, you were out of the arena. And maybe, just sat here today, maybe in the stuff I'm talking about, you might feel as people like I've been out of the game on this. Like I'm in the kingdom. But I don't feel like I represent the kingdom. That's okay, guys. Like, Leanne sent me a message this week. She said, how are you doing? I said, I'm really struggling to, like, eat good food. Well, I'm not struggling to eat good food. I'm eating great food, but too much of it, right? So, because she's, like, my cardiac nurse as well. Um, so she's like, how are you doing? So I'm like, I'm struggling to not be um, <clears throat> cake-obsessed. Um, and, and she said, look, God's always looking to our potential, and not to our current situation. Let him speak to you about who you're becoming. And I was like, thanks for pastoring me, Leanne, you're awesome. <laughs> um, and uh, I, you know, I, was, I was grateful to her for a, for a word. Um, and you know, I, I wanna say to you, if you're sat here and you're challenged, don't just j jump further out because you're challenged. Let's just allow this three months to be a joyful exploration of your human nature, who you are designed to be, that we can each become more who we were designed to be. Don't be stuck by the complexity of thinking I'm far away from that. Let's just start to move forward. And I've got this quote, which I, I heard it and I was like, I'm quite emotional anyway as a character, as some of you know. Um, and I was just in tears by the end that someone was speaking this quote and I was in tears by the end of it because it so got to me about being in the arena. And it's a, a quote you might have heard from Teddy Roosevelt. And it says this, it is not the critic who counts, nor the man who points out the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, and who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there's no effort without error and shortcoming. 
but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasm and great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails whilst daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who never knew either victory or defeat. You know, when we follow Jesus, we're called into something. Something of action, something of being in the arena, of getting our hands dirty, of living this thing out. And it's a challenge to me, a challenge to us, that over these three months where we enjoy this time of exploration, we get to step into the arena. So you know the micro and macro thing Ben was talking about before. It seems a bit weird, isn't it? Our massive gatherings, church big day out, 40,000 people, is a micro event, okay? Always. When we think of our meetings, when we think of our serving the island walk, our doing the giveaway, Revive Cafe, whatever we're doing as a church, they are micro events of concentrated kingdom expression. Do you get what I'm saying? They're like, we come together and we're working to serve outwardly and express this is what the kingdom of God looks like. You come in exhausted on your journey, you get refreshment. This is what the kingdom of God looks like. The macro, the big picture is you out in your place carrying the kingdom of God. Why is it that way round? The microcosms, expressions of the kingdom in here are like fueling events where you then carry the kingdom of God out and you are the church outdoors in your place of work. Imagine four and a half thousand Christians in Jersey carrying the kingdom of God and believing that church is when they step into work. That's why that's the big picture, the big goal. You know, I, I, I just want to challenge us. I, I just want to challenge us today. As we begin to reimagine, to take one step, and that one step is to come to God with an open heart as we reimagine this and be ready uh, to step into the arena once again. There's a stepping into arena right at a basic point, okay? And that is a willingness to be led by him. You know, what, you know sometimes where you go, God, I don't, know what, I don't know what it looks like, but I'm gonna follow you and I'm gonna be open-hearted in this journey. And that's what I ask from you today, not to be incapacitated by the potential complexity that you see, but to be willing to listen, to share, to explore, to reimagine, and that we stand together as a church. And by the way, it's gonna look different to this a lot. It's gonna be a lot of together um, exploring and discussing and opening up. And we're actually gonna break the summer into, into three parts, really. Well, actually the summer bit is gonna be in two parts. We're gonna look at what it means to be the church global. We're gonna be opening the scripture together. What it's like, you know, when I say, you, ex you receive Jesus as your king and you say, I wanna follow you, that's when you enter the church. What does that look like? What is the church marked by? What does it look like on a global level? We're then looking at what does local church look like? What's the point of local church? How do we, how do we look at that? And then we're looking at who are we as Freedom Church and what does God wanna use us uh, to be and do? So that's how we're breaking up uh, this, this time as we reimagine. I'm going to leave you with two questions to discuss together. The first is, do I feel like I'm in the arena or not? Okay, do I feel like I'm in the arena or not? The second is, what maybe is one thing that God's calling me to do to step forward into that arena? Do you, do, do you get those questions? Okay, so I'd love you just to take two minutes with, uh, with the person next to you. First, I'm gonna pray. Because in all of this, we just want him 
to be moving us to be who he wants us to be, more like him. And so, Father, we're so grateful to you for the opportunity to be here. Lord, we're so grateful to you for bringing us together. And Lord, I pray by your Holy Spirit now you'd be opening our hearts and minds to hear you, to see what you're doing and to move in accordance with your will and your work in Jesus' name. By the way, I kind of love that what God left us with was meeting together and an outrageous array of barbecues. <laughs> hey, community happens around the table. Um, so I think we'll pretty much be saying every week, if you want to bring food with you, we're going to eat together. And by the way, let me challenge you. Um, if you've got the financial resource um, and you want to bring a, a bit of food for two extra people, there might be people around uh, who need food. So maybe we can share a bit as well. Uh, that would be awesome.